Good morning. So this is a non-white and I'm back with part two, or I guess we can just call it the second installment of BWE past and present. So as I noted in the description, as I was reading through the two posts, I realized, oh, they're both a little bit lengthy and I don't want to step on or feel the need to compress. I didn't want one video trying to cover both to go too long. And I didn't want and I didn't want to make this like four hours. I forgot to open it in the watch page, my bad. Just so I can um read exactly what I was just trying to describe to you folks. Okay, so there we go. So originally it was supposed to be a comparison of Khadijah from the Sojourner's Passport and a Twitter thread from Kim Love or Kim A-Tube on Twitter. But I'm gonna separate the two. The goal is to come back later on in the afternoon and do a separate video for the um, Kim Love post because it's about, it's like a five or eight piece thread and it deserves a whole lot of attention as this piece does. So I'm just gonna try not to, oh, and I guess the other thing is too, originally I did these as, did, did the first one as a live and I just don't think that that's something I should do particularly. Maybe with these, maybe I can do a stream and then say, hey, did you see this and maybe kind of open it up. It's just, I, I always find myself wanting to engage with the chat and you know whoever happens to show up and what have you that it's probably just easier to do these as installments, you know, that just move through and I don't get a really great question or a really great comment to interact with in the chat and so on and so forth. So anyway, let me share my screen here. Didn't realize I hadn't done that pot. So actually give me one second. Nothing there. Don't accidentally screen share any porn with you guys. <laughs> No, like what time is something that, that didn't happen, but something close to it. Oh, is this done yet? Um, one second. Okay, boom, 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 share. Okay, so again, we're just going to hit one and then we'll hit the other later on in the day. So, so are you guys seeing what I'm seeing here? Yes. Do you see what I see? All right, so uh, a brief introduction. Again, the link is in the description, you can, you know, find everything on the page. So this is the Sojourner, the Sojourner's Passport, which is a blog run by Khadija. Let me say, hopefully I don't get her. I hate when I give up people's last names. Uh, Khadija Nassif, Nassif. Just not sure with how the eye hits, but you know, you see it in the description. And I guess I'll just, I won't move over to it. Just get a little bit of a blurb about her and about the blog itself. Now, I'm actually thinking the more and more I kind of return to this uh, this uh, earlier BWE blog, I'm like, huh, it'd be nice to maybe actually finally read the book. I've read through most of the posts and most of the blog. I just want a quick note, anybody listening, we might have some doggy feedback noise in the background. There's the normal dog plus a doggy house guest for the next few days. So just uh, keep that in mind if you hear any noise in the background, but they're just mostly chill now. So just throwing it out there. But anyway, so, <clears throat> so this is the book. It's also a book of the same name. And I, again, I don't want to, I'll definitely be probably returning to this blog again at some point. So the link's in the description. You can check it out. If anybody wants to leave a comment saying, hey, I looked at it, you know, you should definitely get the book, uh, potentially read it and do a video on it. Be more than happy to at some point. Uh, but I'll probably return to this at least one, one or two more times in the interim. So just keep watching, keep subscribing, and you'll probably definitely be hearing more from me here. 
So I'm just going to kind of zoom in originally just on this is when you come to the home page of this of this blog. She the last the very last blog piece here appears to be November 15th of 2011. So she like Halima kind of wrote for a bit. I think Halima might have written for like a few years. Yeah, I think she wrote for a few years from the late 2000s into about 2015 or so. And I, and I get the impression because this isn't uh, Khadijah has another blog. I'm trying to locate it because there's a piece, uh, or maybe that's Halima. Anyway, I'm going to get lost. Anyway, so, so then you come to the home page. I'll just kind of briefly read this because I think, especially during this whole past present comparison, um, there's a little bit to be said here. So this is her postscript V for Victory. It's like the last blog post on new posts on this site. So that was already eight years ago. Ladies, this is your victory. May God bless you all. This is our collective victory as legitimate BWE, Black Women's Empowerment Bloggers. All praise is due to God Almighty. On Thanksgiving Day, give thanks and rejoice in our collective victory. When I ended the Sojourner's Passport blog over six months ago, I decided that sometime around Thanksgiving Day, I would take another look at the progress made by B the BWE social justice movement. I'm thankful to see that the BWE movement has achieved lasting victory only over after only a few short years. The core BWE message that Black women who are serious about marriage must expand their dating options to include non-Black men has firmly entered the mainstream. One can see this with the conversations and publicity surrounding Ralph Richard Banks' book, Is Marriage for White People? A critical mass of African-American women have heard the BWE message and have moved on into enjoying an abundant life in the global village. They've stopped restricting themselves to the dead Black community and vampiric all-Black social circles. They've stopped hindering their marriage options by refusing to speak or engage in the nothing but a black man self-sabotage. So the post goes on from there, but I'll just leave that, just read that briefly as a kind of a, a point for anyone listening to kind of consider looking around today, looking around Twitter, looking around the YouTube scene, uh, all the kind of black women, BW voices that, you know, move between, you know, the YouTube scene, the social media scene, what have you, I guess even the Instagram scene. That's one thing I have to venture into. I don't have an Instagram account, but I'm picking up quite a few details and people and things of interest that I'm like, I got to, and there's also a lot of food and recipes and stuff over there too. I got to get on Instagram. I think once I actually have like a, well, I have like a decent camera. My phone's camera is pretty legit. Um, anyway, so just think about all those different places. So this is a blog post written eight years ago. When after she said she closed the blog six months prior to November 15, 2011. And I think she, even then, what she knows has even moved even further, uh, particularly here with Ralph Richard Banks' is, is Marriage for White People. Now, Kendall St. Charles you know, did an exhaustive study on that book. And that's something that I, I want to cover too. But I feel like she probably, I mean, obviously, she probably did it best. She spent so much time with it. And she did this already, like, what, going on two years ago. But I, there's a couple of reasons I think I'd like to revisit. And also, I think it'd be an interesting book for me to kind of introduce to, to the to the more dissident right type of circles that tend to kind of run alongside and interact with. I think they, looking at this kind of BW experience, race, marriage, interracial, all that stuff, like if they could kind of see it through this lens, this would be an interesting book for them to consider as well. So I might cover it just to kind of, come around to some of the same maybe, you know, original points and observations that someone like Kendall and a lot of you who, you know, fall, especially I think when she covered that book, she was still on, on YouTube uh, way back when. So it would be interesting to return to as the conversation moves forward. So, you know, leaving this post is, never mind, I'm starting to meander. And this is a new thing for me. I'm recording this before I go to yoga. So I'm actually on keep myself inadvertently on a really good time point. So if I just stop mid thought to keep myself from bantering around, I will do so. So then the second point, a uh, critical mass of black African American women have heard the BW message and have moved on. And the moved on, it, as when I was putting the tags in this video, I was like, oh yeah, divestment. And it's funny how that word has become such a you know, it's almost like Sesame Street, you know, the letter of the day, the word of the day. It's funny how that word and that term has really moved across almost all these black women's circles. And it's an automatic kind of marker for what a lot of the ideas here are and ideas 
and as she's even stating here that we're starting to take hold. So it's funny how every you know few weeks there's always some story, some this, some that. But um, anyway, another tangent. So let me stop there. So anyway, I will be back to this blog for sure. And uh, hmm. Well, I think definitely the book, because there's actually another book that I ended up pulling up that I read actually a few years ago that might be pertinent to this conversation. So anyway, the Sojourner's Passport. Uh, this is by Khadija Nassif. Check it out. Check out the site. Look around. Uh, great resource. I'll definitely be returning here. But let's turn to the post that we are discussing in this kind of in this BWE past present comparison. Again, the Twitter, the current Twitter thread for March May 26th of this year, just last month, is they both deserve their own discussion. And as I was reading this piece here on Sojourner's Passport, I realized, oh man, this is going to be way there's too much here. And I'm almost wondering I might even have to break half of this up just to get through everything. Anyway. Let me just do a quick scan. So this is just comments. Okay. Cause you know how a lot of these blogs that like everything's facing on like the, the you can arrange by subject. Oh lordy. It's so funny looking at comments and you know, we see ourselves in all these discussions now on YouTube and everywhere today. But this is these are conversations black women like ourselves are banding around in December 2010. Crazy. Uh, this is great, you know, I, that's why I really want to do this series because I like, I've all, it, across a lot of disciplines and ideas, I like to look at things past and present and make comparisons and looking at the past and the future and, you know, where you stand today versus something 100 years ago, where you are today versus six months ago. So, anywho, the title of this piece from December 9th of 2010 is titled Straight Talk About Feminine Aesthetics Dress Size Does Not Equal Curves, Fat Rolls Do Not Equal Curves. I've been wanting to talk about black women weight in the whole, you know, subject around it for some time. And I kind of think I want to dive in differently, but maybe this is actually probably better for me to start with someone else's work that is a really big piece here and just kind of pick through it and kind of move through it. Because I still really haven't figured out how to organize it in my head because there's a thousand things to talk about. And I started reading this and I was like, whoa, this is pretty cool. And uh, again, it's a little bit lengthy, and we're not, I'm not reading the entire thing, but because it is pretty lengthy, I've been reading this on my phone and kind of bouncing through. So I'm just going to move through a good chunk of this and just read a passage I find interesting to you, make an observation, move on to the next passage, make an observation, and just kind of keep this, you know, going because I could always maybe follow up and add a few extra little bits of notes on the second video from Kim Love and her Twitter uh, thread. So, this one is jumping right here. Current dogma, refusal to cheerlead obesity equals being an exclusionary oppressor. The current dogma among large numbers of African-American women is what has been called fat acceptance and the cheerleading of obesity. It's taboo amongst African-American women to one, refuse to cheerlead obesity, and two, openly speak out, speak of the ne very real negative consequences of obesity. God help any African-American woman of any weight range who openly warns against obesity and urges African-American women to lose weight. Now, I'll just stop there because that, because again, we all of this she was kind of giving were disclaimers because this is actually the part three of a series that she wrote called Killing Ourselves Softly. So I started with one and two, and then I realized one has is, is featured in here, and two is just kind of like a follow-up question that she gotten from a commenter. Three kind of has everything in one spot. So this, so starting in the middle here, it feels like that because this is actually part three of a few posts that she did in 2010. So when I first started the idea of talking about this particular blog and this subject, um, just checking, I had this fear that like it's on mute. I think like that one day it was like I was muted for like the first 10 minutes. Um, I, I kind of started, I didn't really, I didn't know where I was going to pull this from. But I knew that I wanted to talk about this. And just as a kind of, hmm, wait, we are screen sharing, yes. Just as a quick little side, bringing this current subject into the present. Now, do we all remember just, this is what, what just, this was last month too, the whole Calvin Klein campaign with Billy Ellis, Sean Mendez, and Noah Centineo. 
Now, and we remember, I, I can't not look at her and just not sigh. I mean, I was livid when I saw this. And I found a video where she, because she's a rapper. This is Chica. Um, she has a last name too, but most she goes by her first name, which is Chica. And yeah, Chica Oranika. Okay, so I found this on inside this in style article. Now she wasn't nervous to trip down to her underwear for her My Calvin's campaign. And Kendall covered this briefly because she's in New York and she mentioned the billboard that they use of this photo of her from the Calvin Klein ad. It's this really prominent spot in Soho, something on this wall facing like a main street. Now, so the the weight issue, when I first started reading this inside, I wanted to cover it, made me the most recently think of this whole uh, situation with her and the Calvin Klein ad. And so everyone, I didn't want to pull up her Twitter because I, I found a video of her rap doing like a rap battle against Kanye West and his current political views and some other stuff. So I didn't want to dwell on this, but I'm just going to use her picture to kind of just kind of like as a way to kind of get us into the, what this uh, subject is. So this is the most recent example, the black women obesity question where half of the people, well, it was it's this whole fat acceptance thing. Let me go back to the, it'll probably be easier for me to do this. So the current thing about cheerleading obesity. Now, this was a discussion in 2010. Again, I'll keep going back. This is in 2010. And the same issue still exists today. And I think one key, two key things I will note is this. One, this is something about the whole fat question in Black women that I keep going coming back to in my head that I really want to dig into. Let's go back to was it like the 70s, even the 80s. She's a brick house. And that kind of idea of this black woman being, you know, this thick, you know, curvy, broad, you know, uncompared to, you know, white women. And then, you know, I guess then we could just by proxy throw in Asian women in particular. Hispanic women, there tends to be a variance amongst them from like the slim to like known for their Latina spicy curves and kind of, you know, voluptuousness. You know, Sofia Vergara from Modern Family is probably like one of the best examples of that. And then Jennifer Lopez. Uh, well, keep in mind, I think Sofia Vergara is Brazilian, if I'm not mistaken, is Jennifer Lopez is Puerto Rican. So along that whole Hispanic spectrum, they kind of, there's a horizon, the skinny, slim girls to like the curvy Latinas. So there's been, so the, but the push with black women in this identity around, it's almost like something that just got out of hand. You can like there's the, like a, the whole thing. Marilyn Monroe was technically like more. A t she was like a today's fourteen or today's twelve, but by the time you get to the nineties, especially post heroin chic model, you know that kind of culture that sprung up in the nineties around women like Kate Moss. Every you know anything above a ten, hell even there's a period of above a six, especially amongst white women, just kind of like a little bit too fat or to this or to that. So there just seems to have been something in the culture. And I think rap and hip hop really come along at the end of it. Now it's one thing to say, so this is one other point that I want to talk about black women in fact. Part of it, I have this, I have a theory that it's a part of it is just is, is an evolutionary trait. I'm going to say this in the quickest terms because I don't want to delve into this and sidetrack myself too much. I already know this is going to, have to be a part two to this video. And that's okay. Because maybe we'll just do a a, B, C to this. That's fine. Because I don't want to feel like I'm rushing through this. No, one. One thing that I think is hard with the weight for us, is, especially the Black American women, this is really multifaceted. But let's just take everything from the present out. Let's just go back to people of Sub Saharan African descent on the continent of the motherland. You live in feast, fight or flight, feast and famine conditions, uh, lot of subsistence, subsistence farming. It's some basic general agriculture, but prior, but over more often than not, you're you're eating. Sometimes you're not eating. Sometimes you catch a gazelle. Sometimes you don't. Over a prolonged period of people have evolving in those types of that that type of climate, and those type of evolutionary pressures, especially amongst the women who have to bear children. You know, which goes across every you know every type of mammal, every type of you know female animal you're more likely to hold on to weight and hold fat in certain places, particularly, you know, your stomach and your hips in anticipation of, you know, being the person that, you know, bears children. I'm giving a very rough explanation of this. I apologize. 
But basically, I think that's one of the key factors that needs to be discussed. But again, if we can't have honest discussions about race and genetics, whether it's IQ, whether it's evolutionary behaviors, biology, human biodiversity, we'll never get to this. But I think there, there's a key to explaining Black women in weight if we're able to like to dial this conversation back. Because again, it, it can't be like this whole thing at midnight on December 31st, 1959, everything changed and then boom, the 60s, welfare, quick feminism, blah, blah, blah. It can't, you can't have a similar discussion where everybody just wants to lay at the feet of some type of like one event 50 years ago where a lot of these questions, issues and problems with us goes back further and might actually be more explained by racial differences. They might be better explained by genetics or in a combination thereof. Um, anyway, so I'll just leave that there. That's something to unpack later, but so if, we, if I start from that point way, way back in my head, and then I just look at the past 50 years, when we get back to, you know, she's a brick house, the obesity question with black women becomes an identity, if you will. There have been slim women, there's been thick women, there's, you know, I think maybe even a period of time we kind of inhabited a spectrum too. You know, you had your Diana Rosses and your, Di and your Donna Summers and amongst other very slim, you know, fit, trim black women forever. So this whole fat black woman thing, even more I think about this and I look at over the, the past like 50 years, this doesn't really make any sense. It's the same thing where you go from, uh, yeah, like, you know, the, the you can meet some older, especially boomer, more like silent generation white men who are like, oh, I used to love Donna Summer, I had a crush on Diana Ross. Like, you know, she was so blah, blah, blah to like this whole kind of, ooh, black women, they're fat, they're loud, they're nasty. This all kind of, and for this whole box to just kind of be placed around us. And also for us inviting the box, that is something that's a newer development. That's something within the past 30 to 40 years that that, that we see in the culture. So the obesity, so just rounding that out of the obesity question, a big part of the problem with the wanting to cheerlead is become an identity trope for too many black women. It's become something uh, because we have to talk about, so we, I'll leave it with, with one last point because I want to just move on. But this is one thing that just popped in my head. The problem with talking about the weight question and the obesity question, one of the key things I see is a problem. And I've experienced this in my own family life where a lot of like poor people make poor choices in terms of food. A middle upper middle class family, you know, let's say a white or middle, white or Jewish or Asian middle upper middle class family Going out to like Cheesecake Factory, you know, Family Four can probably spend a hundred bucks there, you know, maybe with or without tip, something close to that. And that's a treat, that's a reward. It's probably maybe a bi week, maybe once a week, maybe a bi weekly, maybe a couple times a month, who knows. But you, you're living maybe, you know, rent assistance, you're a non white, particularly black, maybe Hispanic. You make, enough going to McDonald's or getting like a, like a low key kind of like quick takeout. Like think about like noodles and company, Qdoba, fast food, but you, it's a little bit less fast. You know what I'm kind of saying? Where maybe roughing up $20 to eat a meal like that. But let's just stick with like fast food McDonald's. That's probably an easier way to see this. You're going to, and you're going to eat poorer. You're going to eat a lot fattier, richer, not so good for you things that you really can't afford. Before, so you see this, and I mean, you're seeing this in the hood all the time. It was, it was a treat to actually have five dollars, and if I had five dollars, you know, that I roughed up, you know, after school, I could go get like one or two of those, you know, dollar back when they were a dollar before they raised them dollar fifty. Those dollar bags of flaming hot or Cheetos, and then a few candy bars. I don't know where a lot of you are in the country, but there's these little candies called foodies. They're like these little like mini taffies, and they used to be. You get a bag with 25 of them because they were always a cent a piece, or you get the bigger bag that was 50 of them because they were all a cent a piece. And it was a lot to be able to rough up and do that. Um, so the obesity question, I hate when I hear like, it's because black folks just trapped in poverty. That's why we's fat. It, it's not just that. The question deserves a little bit more unpacking. I'm going to leave that there because it, it, it requires a lot more unpacking. So I'm just saying the obesity cheerleading comes into, there's so many questions that come out of this. But anyway, I've spent enough time on this one paragraph. So let's move forward again. I've wanted to have this discussion for a while. It's good to have someone else kind of to move through a post like this. And then kind of, you can hear me thinking and talking and see what she's saying. This is a good brainstorm for me just even doing this video. All right. 
So she makes a point. Let's just move on because. All right. So again, to the obesity question with black women, this is a problem. And this is written in 2011. It's changing. So I'll do a post script in my own to this because I keep coming across this, this Facebook uh, page that a lot of the black women that follow on Facebook and the Facebook groups are linking. This is called Black Black Weight Loss Success. And this why I haven't really actually visited the site, but people link it a lot. And you're watching black women who are easily like, you know, anywhere between like five feet and five five, about 150, 200, 250 losing the weight, getting from like a, you know, very obese size, 24, 26. On average down to like, you know, like I've seen most of them seem to like just as I'm eyeballing it, hovering around 12 or 14 and they're really getting down there. But uh, this was an anecdote that she's sharing here that was left under, that was on, actually she had a, a guest post over Crystalline's house. So I tried to, oh, it wasn't working in my phone for me to click over to, to the link. Am I, am I back on this page sharing? I'm not. Of course I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm really like struggling with like remembering how to like go in between. It usually just gives you the, oh, because I closed the stupid window. Damn it. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. It's 8.21 in the morning. But I do like doing this a little bit better. Because you, you know, just hover here and it would just give me the option of going back. Uh, whatever. Guess of the inner sanctum. Is this the one? Oh, yeah. September 10th, 27. No, September 17th, 2010. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's a, so it actually is here. It wasn't letting me click over on my phone the way that I wanted to. So this is just a comment that she shares here. That I think is telling when you describe, you know, the obesity problem among certain black women and the kind of thought processes, emotions and what have you that tend to surround it. So I'm just going to read this. So here's a part of the post. Since last Friday, three women I, that I know have passed on. No, I'm not used. I'm not using the right nice words for this. Three women, two good friends of my mother's and one brilliant, caring friend of mine are dead way before their time. My friend, a nurse, a mother, and a comedian that can make a statue laugh, had a heart attack sitting in her car. She was on her way home from work. They found her the next morning dead. She was a big woman. She would always tell me that one day she was going to join me on my walks. Like me, she had diabetes and high blood pressure. Like me, she ignored the signs of trouble, failing eyesight, tiredness, aching limbs, headaches, and put her cares in the hands of Jesus and kept on eating kept right on eating, eating. She would get upset when you got on her about her food choices or how her weight fluctuations were affecting her hormones. She was getting the rash on her neck and the damn near growing a beard. Ain't nobody's business but mine. She was 43. She had two kids. She had a husband. Now her business is their business. They have to bury her and go on without her. So that was actually in part one of, of this uh of this uh threat from Khadijah and she brought it back again and she brought it back again in part three and that is just really so telling of so many experiences that you know I've seen and had directly with other black women in my family particularly my grandmother who uh struggled with her weight most of her life she was she was she, there were times she was a little bit I've, I've seen pictures of her earlier on in the 60s and 50s when she, she was a little bit slimmer but by the time I was born and she was she was in her 50s when I was born and she was yeah, she was pretty heavy then, and she stayed heavy throughout the remainder of her life. But um, just a few key things here. So putting their her cares in the hands of Jesus. Now, whether it's, now whether it's obesity, it's the weight, it's the food. Um, whether it's the weight, whether it's the food, you see this all the time, and you see it across way too many things with black women in particular. You see what black people cross the map, but black women are notorious for this. Everything's in the hands of God. They're going to pray on it. You know, uh, the devil is a lie. This is kind of like mindless, you know, parroting of like a kind of mantra to see if to like try to resolve things that you, that usually does not work. That never really works. And whether it's their, you know, their son or the son who can't, you know, stay off the streets. 
the daughter who can't stay off the streets, running around, you know, showing up with another baby, running off with a boyfriend, you know, running with her ride or die man, you know, just kind of putting the things in the hands of Jesus. That's the stuff that deserves. Yeah, you know, I should be writing this down. I always do this in videos. Maybe I should write this down because that discovery deserves a discussion amongst itself. Because there was a part of this I was going to cover, but I just didn't think I had enough there. But the hands of Jesus, I'm going to say this just as a thought that just pops in my head. It's almost a, I don't think corollary, cor corollary is the right word. I have to look it up in Miriam Webster. I don't want to look it up right now. Let me look over my phone while I say this. The hands of Jesus. You know, putting it into God's hands is like a kind of a, a tangent of the my baby didn't do nothing, you know, didn't do nothing, didn't do nothing. There's, especially with black women, there's all this kind of like, there's this inability to deal with reality and to deal with things in a critical thinking sense. And this is where, especially with a lot more of the, the, the trad dissident right types where I really kind of part ways about, especially with black people, particularly in this religion, going to church, saving black people. I'd argue that religion and Jesus in this whole Christ Christianity of the past 500 years has actually made things worse. Because if you, again, going back to maybe the kind of, maybe a, a race realist, human biodiversity, uh, genetics, IQ discussion of these issues. If, if on average, you're dealing with a population enough black Americans, if the average is 85 IQ, Sub-Saharan Africa, I believe it's like more like 70, 65, 70, somewhere hovering, depending on where you are on the continent, where the average white IQ is close to 100, East Indian, Ashkenazi, Jewish, more like 110, 120. One of the key things that about, about the IQ, about IQ, what it suggests is abstraction, being able to think critically and be able to see things, uh, be able to see nuance. And the problem with religion and faith, there's such a, mm, that's definitely a discussion for another time. I really can't, I'll just really go off into some kind of like thing. So let me just write that down. Um, didn't do nothing, hand of Jesus, religion. Ugh. Okay, we'll come back to that. So she put her cares in hands of Jesus and kept eating what she wanted to eat. Now I just give a quick maybe I'll just give an anecdote here if we want because you guys can see you know just basically in this post I don't need to be a dead horse but I read that they really struck me because that reminds me of like the last five or ten years of my grandmother being alive you know very heavy you know she didn't have both her knees replaced you know she was a diabetic you know insulin um, you know she had a few falls you know it's one thing you know older people whether they're like, you know, bone thin or big and they fall, it becomes more and more problematic the older that you get because bones easier to break, et cetera. I don't think she really ever had any broken bones at the end, thank goodness. Maybe that, you know, being a little extra heavy was kind of a cushion to a certain degree, but um, it becomes a big problem. And they, but she, you know, she still wanted her extra salt on things. <laughs> And then here we go. This is this. I guess I can leave. I'll leave this here. This is a big problem where usually and this is we're talking about race and weight, particularly with black women and drawing a, a big narrative of this to make this make this a lot clearer for us and specific to us. Because you see the walking and the walking is good, but we have a lot of heavier women, heavier people. I think need a little bit more intensity in terms of burning through the fat and burning down the weight that I think. Because at first you see, you'll see a few black women just go, and you know, usually they'll be walking. Like I had my my cousin, my aunt are both heavier too, and they started walking. At, you know, there's like a there's like a local public school that had a, had like a, a racetrack, so they'll go walking, and you'll see them walk the malls. But it, a white woman, typically of a certain height and size, that's on that's maybe about 20, 30 pounds overweight on a certain frame, might get a little bit more results initially or quicker. Than someone that's been than a black woman that's been heavier for a prolonged period of time, and you know walking for everyone is great, and you know it just gets you moving, keeps blood circulating, all the good things we know about walking and why you should do it are there and present. But I believe that black women need something a little bit different, a little bit more specific, tailored to us and our weight histories, our genetic histories, our family histories, our cultural food in the black race and the black community in general. Anyway, so putting your, putting your faith in the hands of Jesus and just continue to eat. I've seen it firsthand and it just ends badly. You know, the crying, the tears, the, you know, having a fall, having, you know, something go wrong with your blood sugar. 
uh, there's so much to say. I've said enough here. I kind of just want to move through some key posts and I'm already kind of getting a little bit stuck. And actually I've got about 15 minutes left before I have to actually really pull out. So I think I'm gonna have to come back. Cause this is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gems here. So this is good to just dive into. I mean, Hmm. I'm debating. Uh, let's see. Bad faith dissenters. Okay. So she's making a point about dress sizes here. And she kind of moves through this because I guess one of the she made the, the first two posts, you know, had comments, and someone came back and there was this kind of back and forth, and and basically it was one of her black woman commenters playing playing stupid. And we and all of us who make content to see this, and it's just kind of like fake, don't know nothing. This was some black woman, well, they're kind of like passive aggressive, like, well, but you didn't like say this about that, and well, what do you mean? And and she's just making a point of saying, well, look, yes, there are black women who do kind of there's, but the 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 the, the quantity of black women with anorexia bulimia is way 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 lower than talking about black women and obesity. There's more numbers on that end than the others. Not to say that one doesn't exist. It's just not worth the the necessary such a grand discussion because it's a lot rarer. So actually, I'm gonna find. The next point that I want to hit here, and I think I'll wrap it up after after I hit the next one, because I want to move into. Okay, all right. So actually, no, that wasn't as long. All right, so there we go. So one, I'll leave one note here because this is um something. This is a book. This is the book that I mentioned before that I've actually that I read. Let's see, where is it? Not all. Come on. Why isn't it? You see, it's not doing the thing where it usually let, used to let me do. I think because I closed the original one. Just leave this open. Okay. I'll just have to move over again. So this is um, a book that I actually read a few years ago. I don't know. I think I, I guess maybe I, I, I forgot why. Cause even then I was curious, you know, did, did any books about black women eating disorders exist? Uh, maybe it came up in a blog. I can't remember for life me how I came across this, but this was, um, it was a pretty good read. So this is called Not All Black Girls Know How to Eat a Story of, a Story of Bulimia by Stephanie Covington Arm, Armstrong. Uh, yes, yeah, so I read this a few years ago. It's very interesting. It's a first person account of a, a black woman. She grew up poor and I think she actually ends up in, I think then this, I think she works or I don't know if she became an actor or not. But anyway, it's an interesting book about an eating disorder, you know, believe me in particular, that is told by a black woman, her experience with it. So, you know, there are stories there. And it is something to be, you know, to be discussed. And she discussed in her book, but the rarity, well, the rarity of her at least being described kind of, hmm. We're more, this is a discussion to be had. And this is what she actually ran into in her other post was that, this is driving me crazy. I think once you close it's the first time you start a video, it won't let you like just move over the way you like to move over. So I'm having to like manually do this every time I want to switch back. Ugh, make me crazy. Anyway, so but so the not all black girls know how to eat and the bulimia story is important, it's worth being told. But the Chica my in my Calvin's uh overweight. Particularly being particularly now, they would have found like you know a lighter skin, you know type two or three C haired woman to to be the overweight black light skin black woman. It's all it's more often than not nine times out of ten going the other direction. So that we have this large darker skinned black woman, and, and someone make the point she's not even like smiling or anything. She's just sitting there, just kind of forlorn, kind of you know womp womp look on her face. So. This kind of moves into the last point of this piece. Honest talk about aesthetics of the feminine hourglass shape. Dress size does not equal curves. 
And she mentions here, there are several reasons I don't think or speak in terms of dress sizes. First, there's such a thing as a person being underweight and still overly fat, having an unfavorable body mass index. Second, even in terms of aesthetics, a dress size alone does not give much meaningful information about a woman's overall look. That's more a matter of proportions. Two women can wear the same dress size and have different looks. One size, whatever woman could be shaped like a pencil with no real curves. Another size, whatever woman could have a generally preferred hourglass shape. And I think that's an interesting thing to, to, to discuss. Dress size versus curves. It, it opens up a whole other discussion. I think particularly with black women, it gets a little bit tricky because, because a lot of it's perception. A lot of it is, particularly to surpass 100 years, 1919. Well, I guess 100 because that'd have been 1919. We had the photograph. We had earlier the earlier points of like film. I think film was still mostly silent in the 19 teen and 20s. So the idea of seeing images of ourselves, of all other races, other people around the world, and what they look like, you know, the, the photograph even, you know, becoming more and more available, accessible to people for the past maybe close to 150 years we get to make a lot of different comparisons to what looks good and what doesn't look good amongst some people or just what some races and groups tend to more naturally on average have and trend towards versus others. So, so again, when it comes to dress size, that's one thing I guess, well, it, I've never noticed that. I mean, I could be wrong and this could just be my frame of reference where I'm from as a black American woman, there's never really been a discussion about, you know, you being a size two versus a size six or 12, where I've heard white, you know, mostly white women have be, think more in terms of dress sizes and those types of proportions, you know, this kind of fixed numerical number where it seems more black women, it runs more from being fat, like, you know, big, thick, you know, obese, kind of big mama fat versus being you know, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I doubt I'm the only one who, who has this experience. Typically, like, the really skinny kind of girls in, you know, most more black communities, like, one or two always end up with the nickname Bean, like, you know, Bean Pole. And they're very, very, you know, kind of like, you know, what we would, if we were to attach a dress size to it, more like a two, a four to six, you know, in some cases, like a two to six, if we were to fix a number to it. But then from there, there's just this kind of general middle that doesn't really get discussed. It's more in terms of how you look, what you, how, how you dress, what you put on. The hips and the booty thing has always been just kind of a thing that we have, and even though that's not true across the map. Plenty of black women will tell you, you know, I have a really flat butt and, you know, I don't really have any hips. I'm not really shaped a certain way. And because of that attribute being so attached to us, I've never really felt that I got to live that experience in particular. But more often than not, we're, I see what she's saying, and I don't really ever think in terms of dress size in particular either. But I guess in a way, it's nice. It's the same with getting on a scale. But when you go to a, you know, you start going to stores, you know, you're, you're at a 14, 16, you're looking down the line towards, you know, 12, towards 10, towards an eight. So then, you know, there's a the tendency to fix a number. But I, but my experience as a black American woman, and yours may be different. We typically don't think in just dress sizes. And I think most even white culture has kind of moved away from that too. But I do at least, you know, remember being kind of an observer into the culture, to more general white woman, white girl culture, you know, kind of think, oh, size six, oh, what's that? You know, that seemed to kind of be the one of the kind of more ideals at that time. But um, anywho, so she kind of moves on into this kind of closing post here which I think is really says a lot. Michelin man type fat rolls are not the same as hourglass curves. Fat rolls do not equal curves. Some concrete examples are appropriate. So I won't, she's just describing the different women here. There's a rose petal. This must be a spoof of the um, American Beauty, uh, Mina Savari in the um, famous rose petal scene. And she's kind of referencing the two below. This is supposed to be Sharon Stone, a fatal attraction, Marilyn Monroe. Now, this is kind of what I think is really key. We see this a little bit too much in, and I think this, ha this has happened, like, again, I guess going back to one of my original points, that this black woman, fat, thick, you know, 
brick house culture went somewhere awry into this like, you know, fat, you know, big black mama and black women overly embraced this. They embraced some of the more negative aspects of it. Having curves is not having roles. And I see way too much of this with, with black women, like this Chica girl. I mean, one thing is she was just curvy, but this woman has fat roles and she is fat. It's not attractive. It's a setback for a lot of us. Or it's just it's a constant setback or the constant representation of this um, black woman, you know, thick, you know, overweight, you know, darker skin look that um, is always pushed forward. And so I guess the dogs are telling me to wrap it up here, huh? <laughs> well, I'm going to let this go up. I think I'll the this you guys are kind of seeing me just kind of get into the mix of this and decide what I want to talk about. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just kind of leave it there. Fat rolls aren't curves. And the weight question, the obesity question has a lot of different aspects that need to be discussed with uh, black women and girls in general, particularly the going along with the girls. But I do see the conversation changing. I think maybe I'll come back with a little bit more of a solid kind of way to discuss this. I know you guys can hear the dogs. I just really don't want to stop now because I'm really pretty much at the end. And they're just goofing off. Hey, play nice. Play nice. <sighs> Fat rolls aren't not curves. I guess one, oh, I was going to make this point. The funny thing is you have a lot of overweight, obese black women justifying having fat roles, but then you have very thin black women who, you know, have a chance to, you know, use their maybe more white Asian standardized size where they cover it when we, if we were to attach a number like a size four, two, four, six, but then they'll talk about wanting to gain weight and put on, you know, some booty and some hips to get, you know, the black male gaze and a lot of that, you know, twerk popular culture look. So it's almost like a, we have black women operating in these two strange uh, parallels. So I'll leave it here because I have to go to yoga and I think they're telling me to wrap it up. Too. So I'll leave it there and I'll be back. Thanks for listening. Over it out.